Welcome to this sixth lecture on the foundations of software testing. Today we're going to look at a few concepts from measurement theory. We don't have any required readings today. We're too close to the end of the course, but we do have several recommendations. My goal is to introduce you to a theoretical framework for questions like, how much testing have we done? These are measurement questions. We can learn a lot about them by studying theory of measurement. The first thing to understand about measurement is that it's not about counting things. Knowing how many branches we've covered, or how many tests we've run, or how many bugs we've found, doesn't answer the questions we want answered. Those questions are questions like, how good is this product? Or how much testing do we have left? Or how competent is this programmer? To turn our numbers into answers, we need a model. We need a model that tells us how and why we can use these numbers to estimate the answers to those questions. The starting point for measurement is the attribute, the thing we're trying to measure. For example, when we ask how good is this product, our attribute is product quality. We might use many kinds of data to estimate a value for an attribute, but the reason we collect those data is to get an estimate of this attribute, product quality. Once we know what type of information we're looking for, our next question is how to get it. In practice, we probably use one or more measuring instruments. Let's work through these ideas with an example. Suppose you're going to use a projector when you give a presentation. You'll project your slides onto a screen. Well, how wide is that screen? Now, if what you're really trying to find out is how wide the screen is, then that's your attribute. We can use a tape measure as our instrument. Suppose we get a reading of 40 with the tape measure. We interpret that as meaning the screen is 40 inches wide. We can use this very simple case to illustrate some of the challenges of measurement. Let's start with measurement error. When you stretch a tape across the screen and get 40 inches, do you hold the tape perfectly level? perfectly taut? If you took the measurement again, would you get exactly the same number the second time? What I mean by measurement error is the random variation we get when we take a measurement. The next challenge is precision. If you get a tape measure that shows distance in miles, all it will tell you about a 40-inch screen is that the width is a lot less than a mile. Your measurement won't be precise enough. On the other hand, it rarely makes sense to measure a distance of a mile with an instrument that counts inches. I think of precision and variation as technical issues. They're important, but we usually have straightforward methods for dealing with them. Figuring out why you are taking this measurement is a much harder question. Why do you want to know the width of this projector? Why do you care what the quality of this product is? Asking about your purpose often leads you to realize that you don't actually care about the attribute you think you're measuring. You're actually trying to find out about something else. For example, suppose you were trying to figure out whether people could read the text on your slides. Start up by asking, how wide is this screen? But then you ask about your purpose. Why do I want to know how wide this screen is? And then you answer, I want to estimate how big the letters will be when I project my slides. Then you ask the next question, why do I want to know how big the letters will be when I project the slides? Your answer, I want to know whether people can read my slides. Ha! That's a very different question, and knowing the screen width might not answer it. In a small room, people sitting very close to the screen, they can see small letters. In a huge room, people sitting very far back, they need much bigger letters. The number you really want to know is how big the letters will be to a person sitting as far away from the screen as they can sit in this room. You actually want to measure your slide's letter sizes in degrees of visual angle at a certain distance from the screen. The sequence of discovering your underlying goal by asking why and why again and again is often called the five whys analysis. Sometimes you can understand your purpose completely with one answer. Why do I need to know how wide this screen is? Answer, I want to roll up the screen and move it in my truck. If the rolled up screen is longer than six feet, it won't fit. In that case, we don't need to ask more questions. We don't need to be very precise either. Even if we measure the screen as 50 inches instead of the correct 40, it's a huge measurement error, but it still leads us to the correct conclusion, this screen will fit in the truck. If we're just moving one screen in one truck on one day, we only need to measure one screen. But suppose instead we're trying to understand whether there's too much manufacturing variation in these screens. In this case, we're going to measure the width of a lot of screens. We might be drawing a conclusion about the variability of an entire factory's manufacturing process. This is a much broader scope. As a software example, suppose we were trying to estimate the quality of a program. We might be interested in only that program. We might be interested in all programs written by this specific person or this specific team of programmers. We might be interested in all programs made by this company. Three very different scopes. We'll close this simple example by considering our scale of measurement. The reading we got off the tape measure was 40. 
But 40 doesn't mean much until we add the units of measurement, 40 inches. Our scale was width as measured in inches. Scale of measurement is critically important. Without it, our measurements are like 40, meaningless because you don't know 40 of what. Scale of measurement from a tape measure is so obvious that many people find it hard to think about scale with this example. So let me give you a different example. Suppose we present noises to a person and ask how loud they are. We can measure the physical sound pressure level of these noises. The scale for that is called decibels. For example, quiet conversation in a quiet room, that's about 40 decibels. If you're near a busy road, loud traffic noise is about 80 decibels. If you're near a jackhammer breaking up the road, 100 decibels. Now let's present these sounds to a person. Our goal is to estimate perceived loudness, how loud different noises seem to people. So we'll use a person as our measuring instrument. This is really the only measuring instrument we can use because when you hear a sound, only you know how loud that sound seems to be to you. And that's what we're trying to find out. So let's play a sound and ask a person how loud it is. A person says three to a quiet sound and six to a louder sound. What do three and six mean? With inches, we know that six inches is twice as wide as three inches. But is that how it works for sounds? Is a six rated sound twice as loud as a three rated sound? Actually, probably not. Numbers don't always have all the properties we expect of numbers. With inches, they do. Six inches is twice as big as three inches. 600 inches is twice as big as 300. That describes a ratio scale. But consider temperature. Is 100 degrees Fahrenheit twice as hot as 50? Well, if so, then when we convert temperatures from Fahrenheit to centigrade, 37.8 degrees centigrade should be twice 10. And that doesn't sound right. So our common units for temperature are not ratio scaled. They're interval scaled. What an interval scale means is that the differences between numbers are consistent, not the ratios between them. So the difference between 100 degrees Fahrenheit and 75 is the same as the difference between 75 and 50. In Fahrenheit, that difference is 25 degrees in both cases. If you convert to centigrade, the difference is 13.9 degrees in both cases. A third kind of scale is ordinal. All we know about ordinal numbers is that 2 is smaller than 3. We don't know how much smaller, we just know it's smaller. If you tell me you ran 5th in a race, I know you ran faster than the 6th place person and slower than the 4th place person, but I don't know how much faster. Imagine you're evaluating staff. You might know that Jane is a better programmer than Joe and decide to pay her more, but how much better? If our measurements are ordinal, we can say that Jane is a better programmer, but we can't say by how much. We can't say that Jane deserves twice what Joe makes because Jane's twice as good. Being able to rank our programmers from best to worst, that might be as precise as we can get. Finally, we have nominal scales. Two things are different if they have different names. Which one is better? We don't know better. We just know different. In software engineering, none of our measurements are as straightforward as reading inches from tape measures. We can't even agree on how to measure the size of a program. So that brings us back to our structure for thinking about measurements and to our most important starting point, the attribute. What do we think we mean by the size of a program or the skill of a programmer? Not how do we measure it, but what are we really trying to measure? If we don't understand what attribute we're trying to measure, how can we know if our measure of it is any good? Measurement theorists often talk about the validity of a measurement. If we want to measure programmer skill this way, is that measurement valid? Does it really tell us about programmer skill? My first doctorate was in psychophysics. This field applies measurement theory to subjective magnitudes, like how loud something feels or how hot something is. I've read about theory of measurement in many fields, chemistry, economics, medicine, physics, psychology, sociology, and so on. Every other field that I've studied has a more sophisticated approach to measurement and pays more attention to validity than computer science and software engineering. We spend a lot of time arguing about how to write programs to count things efficiently, but we spend almost no time on the measurement validity of those counts.